Well, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for being here uh, with us tonight. We are the co-chairs of Women in Design, Jennifer Lee and Lafinep Dominitaki, and we want to begin by acknowledging that the Harvard Graduate School of Design is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present and future, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. The school also recognizes the work of the Harvard University Native American program in cultivating the relationships that led to the creation of this acknowledgement. Further, we urge you to read the Rematriation Resource Guide, which is a quick Google search, to begin learning how to act, support, and take action from the writings of urban indigenous women. A quick reminder that we have live captioning available tonight for our virtual audience. To enable captions, click the closed captioning button at the bottom of the live stream window. And now, without further ado, uh, ranging from teaching, writing, directing, chairing, podcasting, and organizing, Anuranda Ayer Siddiqui's work uh, specializes in histories of architecture, modernity, and migration, centering African and so South Asian questions of historicity and archives, heritage politics, and feminist and colonial practices. She is an assistant professor at Barnard College, Columbia University, where she also directs Insurgent Domesticities, uh, the study of social difference working group at the Columbia University Center. She has authored a manual of books with a forthcoming manuscript, Architecture of Migration, examining the history, visual rhetoric, and spatial politics of the Dadaab refugee camps in northeastern Kenya. She is co-editor of the volume Spatial Violence, and her writings appear in several academic journals, including the Journal of Society of Architectural Historians, the Journal of Architecture, Grey Room, Eflux Architecture, and the Phenomenalist. Her scholarship aims to foreground histories of marginalized people and figures and promote practices of collaboration and support, especially concerning the lives and narratives of communities that have been systematically excluded or silenced. Thinking through objects, buildings, and landscapes, her work examines intellectual histories and diverse forms of aesthetic practice and cultural production. Before we hand the mic over to Dr. Anurada, we'd like to thank Paige Johnston and the rest of the public programs team for their correspondence and coordination to make the, this keynote happen. On the theme of today's keynote, Intersectional Spaces of Care, Women in Design is honored to introduce Dr. Anurada Ayer Siddiqui. Thank you. Does it sound okay, everyone? Thank you so much for that very warm introduction. It's just such a pleasure to be here. And really, um, I, I just wanna thank you for this privilege, but also the luxury of having a little space to think together, which is really what I'm gonna do today. And um, which is also a way to say that some of what I want to present today isn't fully resolved or thought through. I really wanted to put some things on the table to get us started with something that is called International Women's Week, um, that maybe we can debate what that's about. But I think um, I've, been, um, I've been very privileged this year to be able to think about a lot of women and think with a lot of women. So I'm very happy to be able to share some of that with you today. So. Um, uh, in addition to uh, Lafina and Jen, I really want to thank everyone who's been involved in organizing this and also many both seen and unseen laborers that make academic work possible. My own scholarship is supported by an institution that occupies the unceded land of Lenape Hoking, uh, which is stewarded to this day by elders, children, and relatives of the Lenape and other indigenous nations and communities for which New York is home. So. I was asked to share some thoughts on intersectionality and care. Um, we maybe ought to turn today to the important work of Kimberly Crenshaw and Elke Krasny and others, um, but maybe that can be on the agenda for a future conversation because lately I've been thinking about citational politics and citational practices. What does it mean to cite? 
what are the ways that a scholar uses citation? That's a lot of what I've been thinking about. But what are the ways that an architect uses citation? That's another thing I've been really spending a lot of time thinking about. Who to cite? How to cite? Can citation provide a scaffold of intersectional care? How do we make a scaffold of intersectional care that strengthens us, that gives us speech, or perhaps a little further, that enables us to speak to power, to talk back? Citation is a practice that we develop, negotiate, and commit to in the ways we name each other's work, the ways we name each other's ongoing practices, the ways we name each other's words, and the ways that we name each other's names. Citation as a way for caring for each other can give us powerful collective speech. As a way of caring for each other, it enables us to intersect in an intellectual commons. It enables us to find intersections we may not previously have seen, uh, commonalities that strengthen us. And so I want to talk through these conceptual issues drawing from two different books that I have been working on, on subjects that have come to mean a great deal to me. And while these are conceptual issues, they're really, for me, very much grounded in empirical research. Um, and so my empirical research for these two books led me to the work of two different figures whose work I'm going to discuss today thinking on their citational practices, and also thinking on my own practice of citing them, and our collective practice of building a citational scaffold around them. What citing them does for them, and also for us. So the first uh, subject is the work of the woman on the screen here, her name is Shamsa Abdullah Farah, and her work points to the broader work of women in the refugee settlements established in 1991 in Dadaab, Kenya, on the border of Somalia in East Africa. Um, these settlements are the focus of my book, Architecture of Migration, that's coming out later this year. We would not technically call Farah this figure an architect, though in her circumstances as a designer, a builder, a coordinator of spatial practice in Dadaab, an author within the humanitarian regime who constructed international expertise for the NGO Norwegian Refugee Council, it would be difficult not to call her an architect, and it would be even more difficult not to cite her work. The second subject uh, is the work of the architect Minet da Silva, who practiced in Sri Lanka, India, and Hong Kong from the 1940s to the 1990s. And her work points to the broader intellectual interventions of architecture into the most pressing matters of poetics and politics. We would technically call da Silva this figure an architect, though in her circumstances, starting a practice as sole principal in 1947, inventing new design languages that integrated modern grammars with the materialities and significations of the arts and crafts, medieval arts and crafts, entangling buildings inextricably with landscapes and ecologies, and making cohabitations with nature a demand of modern architecture. In spite of these, I think what we could call prescient practices back in the 40s and 50s, she was rarely recognized or celebrated or cited. So each of these figures as subjects offers a discursive access point to think about citational practice and citational politics. Uh, each of these subjects, in different ways, talks back. I don't mean in their daily lives as figures, which I'm sure they have done, but I mean in larger discursive regimes as subjects. So I have been working on how to help create the chamber for that, that larger discursive speech, how um, a figure becomes a subject through the ways that a historian makes a space of care. So I want to, you know, in doing this, cite someone who has helped us 
create chambers for exactly this kind of speech. Talking back is a problem elucidated by this beautiful person, an elder sister to all of us who are thinking about how to impregnate our transactions with the force of care to make them into scaffolds for the speech of not only just ourselves, but many others, others who represent diverse forms of social difference, intersection, and solidarity. Her way of talking back was not rooted in anger, which itself can be productive, but in collective justice, dialogue, and discourse, and love. In the eponymous essay in this book on the screen, Bell Hook spends time talking about how she grew up, her experience learning that she should not talk back, um, certainly not to elders, not to white people, not to people in authority. Uh, she narrates in the book how she, Gloria Watkins, took on the name Bell Hooks. If you don't mind, I'm going to read this out because I think what she says is very important. One of the many reasons I chose to write using the pseudonym Bell Hooks, a family name, was to construct a writer identity that would challenge and subdue all impulses leading me away from speech into silence. I was a young girl buying bubble gum at the corner store when I first really heard the full name Bell Hooks. I had just talked back to a grown person. Even now I can recall the surprised look, the mocking tones that informed me I must be kin to Bell Hooks, a sharp-tongued woman, a woman who spoke her mind, a woman who was not afraid to talk back. I claimed this legacy of defiance, of will, of courage, affirming my link to female ancestors who were bold and daring in their speech. Unlike my bold and daring mother and grandmother who were not supportive of talking back, even though they were assertive and powerful in their speech, Bell Hooks, as I discovered, claimed, and invented her, was my ally, my support. And this Bell Hooks is a, a great, or sorry, the original Bell Hooks is a great grandmother um, to Bell Hooks, the writer. So we hear in this powerful, imaginative assumption of a great grandmother's name, a living practice of citation. Yet we soon learn that this is no narcissistic, individualistic appropriation. And if you don't mind, I'm going to read this as well. Moving from silence into speech is for the oppressed, the colonized, the exploited, and those who stand and struggle side by side, a gesture of defiance that heals, that makes new life and new growth possible. It is that act of speech, of talking back, that is no mere gesture of empty words, that is the expression of our movement from object to subject, the liberated voice. If this form of liberated speech marks the movement from object to subject, or figure to subject, as I've proposed, then it's also important to note that this movement seems to be on behalf of those who stand and struggle side by side, Bell Hooks names our movement from object to subject. So how does citation help us think with that problem of collective speech and transformation? Uh, Emily Kalachi, professor of African history at University of Wisconsin-Madison, wrote a really wonderful essay um, in the American Historical Review called On Acknowledgements, which is about to go on all of my syllabi, and I hope you will all take some time to read it. And she talks about, in that essay, she talks about the acknowledgements in academic books, how we typically read them, how we should read them, how citational frameworks in something like the acknowledgements can reproduce structural exclusions. Um, it's an important article that I hope you'll all read and discuss. Um, but I'm going to focus on one of the points that she underscores, raised by Walter Rodney on the collective construction of knowledge and the reproduction of power structures in knowledge production. Um, she, Kalachi writes, in the acknowledgments to the 1972 classic, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, historian Walter Rodney wrote, contrary to the fashion in most prefaces, I will not add that all mistakes and shortcomings are entirely my responsibility. 
That is sheer bourgeois subjectivism. Responsibility in matters of these sorts is always collective, especially with regard to the remedying of shortcomings. He was referring to one of the core cliches in the genre of acknowledgement writing in which scholars humbly give praise and credit to their advisors and patrons while simultaneously releasing them from responsibility or criticism. Rodney brings our attention to the inherent conservatism of this seemingly virtuous gesture. While in each individual case, the quote, all credit goes to my mentors, all mistakes are my own, end of quote statement, is an expression of gratitude and humility. When repeated over and over again across hundreds of books, the cliche signals a collective agreement that the leaders in the discipline and educators of a future generation should receive credit and praise, but bear no responsibility for the shape of the field as it unfolds. Rodney provokes us to consider how knowledge is produced not through the benevolence of our mentors and senior colleagues, but instead through the power structures of the profession for which we all bear responsibility. So I want to take um, Kalachi's reading of Rodney and ask you, how can we think about the power structures in terms of our collective work to design, make, comprehend built environments, and use them to understand things like history, heritage. Um, I'm going to ask Matt if you could pull up um, the website that we showed. So one experiment um, that I um, had the privilege of engaging in with many people, um, first my co-collaborator, Rachel Lee, um, and then many, many authors and readers is this project called Feminist Architectural Histories of Migration. And I want to talk a little bit about one thing we did here uh, of many to try to create a citational scaffold, something that would mirror that power structure that Kalachi and Rodney are talking about. Um, and you know, it's a it's a massive collection across three um, online journals, and um, the journals are Architecture Beyond Europe, the Canadian Centre for Architecture, and Aggregate, which is what this page is from. And the aggregate, um, the essays that went into aggregate, aggregate were the very last ones. But one thing that Rachel and I realized, I mean, we were. It's called. Feminist Architectural Histories of Migration. So one of the things that we were really trying to deal with was this idea of migration as object and subject. And we were thinking, you know, maybe a little bit defiantly at the time, what if we just put this whole collection into an online journal, really to confront the ephemerality of that? It's very different making paper scholarship. Um, it lives um, a little bit longer. And um, to take the deep, deep research and concerns of what I think are uniformly excellent essays, this is not a collection with uneven um, contributions. Every single article in this collection is just hitting it out of the park. But to put them in an online collection is a bit risky because it's suggesting that, um, you know, the, online journals disappear every day. So some of what we were trying to say is that what we can do with this digital platform is really speak to something like migration and use the platform itself to make a scaffold around these migrant subjects and these even these migrant authors. So one very direct way that we decided to do that is to think about what it means to make a collection, what it means and what we all hope it means as scholars or even as architectural writers is that we have readers. So we invited a number of people who we admired very much to be readers for the collection. And um, at the risk of um, embarrassing one of my colleagues who happens to be in the room, I'd like to ask Matt if you could just play the reading. My name is Itohan Osaiwase, and I'm reading an excerpt from Lena Bobardi as Migrant, From Collector to Cohabitant by Anna Maria Leon. 
I selected this excerpt because it offers the most nuanced analysis of Bobardi that I have come across. Is Bobardi's act of collecting the popular a decolonization of the museum, or is it an entrenchment of modernism's complicity with colonialism? She famously populated her house with quotidian, anonymously produced, handcrafted objects from the Brazilian Northeast. These obje objects were thus also displaced and repurposed to populate Bobardi's modernist interior. Certainly, modernist architects have a long history of fetishizing and othering cultures beyond their own experience. What dis distances Bobardi from these well-known personalities is that her relationship with the popular production of Brazil evolved from the reproduction of Eurocentric gaze to enthusiastic and problematic appropriation to eager claims for a politics of the popular. The presence of these objects in her house was not accidental. They were welcome roommates invited to share the modernist box. Thank you so much. So um, well, there's about 20 of these. Um, what I think is really important about um, making this little film, our, our colleague Will Davis made this film, and um, the readers sent in videos of themselves reading. Um, and he um, stitched them together into a small film, um, which you may also want to see. Um, what I think is very important about this is that it creates a kind of scaffold around the writing so that the writing isn't just falling into a vacuum, it's really being held. You have um, you know, a scholar telling you why she wanted to, why she wanted to read this, why it was important. So to me, that was a very important um, way to start thinking collectively about what we're doing when we're making scholarship. Um, it was a way of, uh, let's say, leaning on intersections, but it was also a, a certain kind of care, scholarly care. So, um, you know, I just want you to hold that for a minute, and um, I'm going to go back now and um, talk about these two figures who I had introduced earlier. Um, maybe, Matt, if you don't mind uh, bringing up the PowerPoint again, just to the point that we, the Walter Rodney slide, yeah. Um, you know, the, the two figures that I'll talk about next, um, they, they happen to be the two figures that I wrote about for a big encyclopedia project um, edited by Lori Brown and Karen Burns. Um, there are many um, critiques of this global encyclopedia that's been created and the way that regions have been reified and just the whole idea of what is a woman, why are we writing about a woman, what does that mean? Um, but I think that, um, you know, it's a big project and it uh, was trying to be as inclusive as possible in certain ways. And I, I do think that one thing that it does is demand that we think about intersections and also demand that we think about how we care for people who have been left out of a certain set of narratives. Um, so let me get into the specifics of these two figures because I think these figures, the way that they uh, make use of citations and the way that you know, I, as a historian, am citing them, and the way that we might all think of them within a citational scaffold might also be instructive for us. So, the, um, you know, th sorry, I'm ahead in the slides. So one of the projects that I've worked on is this project on um, Dadaab Kenya, and this is this image will tell you, um, you know, one of the ways in which it is most often imaged, um, which is very impersonally from satellite, and that too a satellite that's often used for surveillance. Um, there are concerned journalists who um, are, you know take their concern in order to make images that have a little more detail, are maybe a little more intimate, and are trying to tell us a little more about the materiality and the life of these spaces. So these are, you know, different approaches. Now, I, in uh, my book, 
started thinking very differently about how a space like this might be imaged. And I started working with um, a number of artists, including another artist who is in the room right now, who gave us a new way to start thinking about satellites. This is a satellite study in which she provincializes the actual satellite. Um, Elsa, you're here, right? I don't know if she's still in the room. Um, this is um, by um, a set of architects called uh, Cave Bureau, um, Kabage Karanja and Stella Mutegi in Nairobi, who are thinking not just about the way that the, that the camps live, um, the camps are imaged from the sky, but the way we can think of them from underneath the ground. They study the aquifer underneath the camps. And here, too, they're studying this underground cave Un, un, that is really giving the settlements the capacity to exist. Um, this, to me, was a, a different kind of citational practice, thinking about how to cite the actual um, the settlements themselves, rather than through an impersonal and somewhat violent um, um, satellite image. Again, with respect to the concern of a photojournalist who is able to, to get close and yet also stay far away, I thought a little bit in my own photography about what it meant to get right up close to an architecture that you are typically not meant to be close to. The minute you see images like this, you start to understand what it means to stand very close to a situation that um, you know yourself to be in a space of privilege in relation to. But then I also started thinking about images like that through um, the work of, this is another artist, Deka Abshir, um, who's also based in Nairobi. And I started thinking, what if we don't think through the images made by the agencies at all? What if we really only think through images made by artists um, people who have absolutely no stake in controlling people's migration. Um, so again, I see these things as another way of citing architecture. But maybe the biggest way that I worked with citation in this project was really through talking to actual people, again, like, like Shamsu Abdullah Farah, who I opened with, um, these are not people that I think we could technically call architects, and yet you can't look at what they're doing and not call, with, call them architects. They, they are absolutely making the landscapes, the buildings, um, and the designs that we find in Dadaab. Um, this is Maganai Sadiq Hassan and the, uh, the garden that she designed, her farm, as she calls it. Um, Hawa Danyeru who um, I met on her arrival to IFO camp um, in a rather desperate situation. She took the time to talk with me um, and was on her way to um, building a shelter using the materials that she's carrying right on her back. I met a number of women who had already been working together for quite a while to design and build a restaurant on the border between the Sudanese neighborhood and the Somali neighborhood in the camps, in one of the camps. Um, and again, um, this um, architect, if I can call her that, um, Shamsul Farah, who um, I write about because I think she does occupy a unique position in that she developed a project for um, the NGO, the Norwegian Refugee Council, and through her work with them, essentially built up expertise that really shored their international reputation. Um, she worked on a shelter, and one of their sort of first big shelter initiatives um, in, um, in Dadaab, and um, ended up building the houses that you see here, as well as that shop, which was the, you know, the image was in the, in the previous slide. Um, and uh, she built the house directing a construction crew uh, made up of her family members. I show the images of the children here because they've aged now and they won't be recognized. Um, but again, it's been very important to me to think with 
someone like this who is working as an architect in a context in which she can't be cited as such, and also to understand what that means and why what we think architecture is if we can't call the children in this photo the actual architects if they actually designed and built the spaces that we're looking at. Um, the second figure um, is uh, perhaps better known within these citational frameworks. Um, this is an image of Minette de Silva from um, the Women's Education Resource Center in Colombo. Um, it's a library on women's work. Um, and, you know, I think she's rather well known as a very uh, privileged figure. She comes from a family that um, became very prominent in the anti-colonial um, movement in Sri Lanka, and her, her father was a minister in the new independent government. Um, so in some ways, she's often thought of as someone who had um, great mobility, great social as well as physical mobility. Um, I want to draw your attention to her not only as an architect, but as a literary person. Um, she, uh, we have this photograph thanks to um, another architect who worked with her. His name is Selva Sandra Pragas, and I'm grateful to him for sharing this, this photo because I think it just tells you the kind of architect that she was. Um, that in some ways her um, imagination of uh, a kind of her own sort of citational scaffold ha was a very literary one. Um, and she herself made a book, um, one of the last works of her life. She made many, many buildings and many other kinds of projects, different forms of cultural production. But she also made this book. And I, I mentioned the book because I think it gets at these, this intersection of uh, you know, problematic forms of citation, both scholarly citation and architectural citation. And in some ways, her citational practice is one that I hope we can talk further about. So in the book are uh, many photographs of her, um, including the one in the center of the, the photograph here, many um, images of her on a construction site, in fact. Um, now, the other thing that she did in her practice and appears um, in, a, in the book in a lot of ways, and I'll show you her first project that you may or may not know, um, but she worked very closely with craftspeople in the area around um, Kandy, Sri Lanka, which is where she lived, which is in the center of the island. And um, I've, I've had the opportunity um, this year to meet um, many of the people who are the descendants of people that she worked with. Um, as she wrote in the book, growing up in my parents' world of politics meant that for us, cultural and political developments could not be clearly separated. Encouraging the development of arts and crafts became also a means of uplifting the underprivileged and was thus intrinsically linked to the movement for universal franchise. Um, you hear from this a little bit of her motivations and you can also hear in terms like underprivileged, I mean, you can hear a sort of patriarchal tone. Also, there's a way in which her own positionality is, is um, comes into question when we read something like this. Um, who's helping who exactly is a question that might come to mind. But um, if you just hold on to that for a moment, I mean, some of what I think is a, a really important thing to think about is not just who she is citing, but how she is citing them. How is she using citation as a way to think with architecture and as a way to um, give credit to the very people that she's talking about, to uplift people. Um, this kind of a map um, is very common now, this kind of tourist map of the, the crafts production that you might find in different parts, different regions of a country. Um, I want to argue that um, this kind of a map is made possible because of the labors of this particular architect who worked to put a lot of these things on the map. Um, that's another big story that I don't have time to get into right now. But um, what I do want to do is show you her very first commission, because I think it will explain a little bit of what she's trying to do in terms of putting the work of craftspeople 
um, into her work in such a way that her own work creates a citational scaffold. It acts as a sort of, the architecture itself acts as a sort of epistemic scaffold. Um, this is a house for um, a family that was very close to her family, the Karunaratna family. Um, uh, their um, father, Mr. Algernon Karunaratne, was a partner in law, in a law firm with uh, Minette de Silva's own father, George de Silva. Um, and these are um, images from the house that I took back in 2014. It's, uh, it, it was already, um, you know, slated for demolition in a sense, not exactly slated. It was owned and basically abandoned, but um, Hopefully this sort of gives you a sense of the house, um, the kinds of spaces, the ways in which the house took in landscape. Um, but one of the, these are images from her own book. One of the very important things she does is quite literally insert um, really iconic craft elements into the architecture. She does it in this way, for example, using um, the um, mat weaving tradition from the Dumbara Valley, which is very close to um, her own home, um, inserting that into a door, inserting a mat into a door. We understand this from um, um, Ananda Kumarasamy's work. Um, he's um, an art historian who uh, worked in Sri Lanka um, many years earlier. This Dumbara mat comes from this hemp plant um, and is dried and dyed and um, made into materials that can be used for weaving. You can kind of see on the right um, the way the woven elements work. She, in her practice, had started a, um, a kind of side business called Ceylon Candy and Handlooms, um, which, is a, which is intended to um, really make use of the work of craftspeople um, and actually bring this work into a contemporary economy. Um, she herself learned weaving, and she had um, a modern loom that she kept on her veranda. She would you know, invite craftspeople home, but she would also herself weave. And these are some of her early experiments. Um, some of her early experiments also include um, textiles, these saris that she designed. Um, they, um, as I was told by her niece, um, Helga de Silva Blo Pereira. Um, these are some of her very favorite saris, and she would wear them to very important events. And late in her life, she was honored um, um, by the French government, by the Sri Lankan Institute of Architects, and she wore these saris to those events. But we see, um, again, drawing from uh, Kumara Sami's work, and I'll, I'll explain why in a minute. Um, we see um, this kind of long textile tradition in these regions right around Kandy, where she's from. The, um, the house for the Karuna Ratnas, they, that house actually includes a lot of um, these various different crafts traditions from the region right around um, where the house is located. So things like terracotta tile that uses um, a very common motif that's found um, in temples around Kandy. You see this, uh, this is from the Ambeke temple. You see it in a lot of different media. Um, this is that same temple where this is found. Um, another um, craft tradition from the region is this lacquer painted wood. These, um, these wooden railings that she uses in the balustrade of the same house um, come from a tradition of um, this kind of, this thing, it's called a sesat. It's a bit like a fan or that's used in royal processions. So you see the, the pole that's holding up the fan. Um, and that sesat is what is then used. So um, I want to dwell for a minute again on this practice of citation on um, a page from her book. And again, noting that um, you know she's, as you can read at the very top of the page, village of Palle Hapuvida. Hapuvida is a village um, that is known for lac its lacquer wood workers and lacquer wood making. Um, and so she's gone to this village. You can sort of see that she's, um, you know, it, how picturesque it is. It's still um, 
there are um, villages and sub-villages that are even to this day not reachable by car. But you can see her in the, um, in the photograph at the top right uh, looking very intently at a demonstration of the lacquer process um, with these craftspeople. Um, we had the opportunity, um, very exciting opportunity to, um, to meet some of the grandchildren of the people in the photograph at the top right. Um, the, um, um, let me see if I can, I don't know how to, I want to be able to go back if I advance it. And um, some of these people, and you can see um, they're keeping the, the same tradition alive. They're making these same sort of wooden, lacquered wood uh, materials. Um, they um, very um, happily told us about uh, Minette's time with their grandparents. They didn't know her personally, but um, the, the two people on the, oh, sorry, I'll show you that in a minute, but um, the man that's standing behind Minette, um, his name is uh, Mr. Hinami, and the man who's sitting and uh, doing the demonstration is a man called Abrana Apu, who's the, um, the grandfather of the two craftspeople on the very right. So some of what I came to learn in this process and just thinking about why an architect would put a photograph like this in her book and what is she doing with that photograph, especially when she's not naming the craftspeople, but she is explaining her own research in a sense. She's giving us a way into understanding you know, how she's selecting work to include within her own buildings. Um, to me, one way to understand this is as a citational practice. That even though she's not following a kind of scholarly method of naming everyone and making sure that she's very um, precise, historically precise in that sense, she is doing another form of citation in not just including their work in her buildings, but including images of them in the process of making the work. There's something about that that um, has been lodged in my head as something to really think about. Also, because I think it evinces a certain citational politics. Now, the thing that is very complicated and let's say intersectional about Minette de Silva, um, and again, I think it's really important to understand that she's only ever really understood through her privilege that, oh, this is a person who was educated in Bombay and in London and she's traveled around the world and she knew Le Corbusier and I, whatever else people know about her. Um, the fact is that um, she lived most of her life in, in Sri Lanka and w most of her built projects were in Sri Lanka. She has uh, built buildings on site. You see many, many photographs of her having been on um, job sites and then you see a photograph like this. Now, the, The one thing that is a little bit painful to talk about, and it, it, it will be painful and we still have to talk about it, um, is caste. Um, a community of people who can do this kind of lacquer work, who's, who have been doing this kind of lacquer work for generations, who's, you know, the next generation is still doing it, um, belong to a certain caste. The caste um, system in Sri Lanka is a bit different than it is in India, in which you know it's not as maybe. It's a, I don't I don't anyway I don't want to oversimplify by trying to describe anything uh, right now. But what I do want to say is that Minette herself came from a very mixed race and mixed caste background. So in one way, when we look at an image like this. We can look at it like, oh, okay, this is a, basically a tourist coming to see a village. You see like all the kids are gathered around in some of the photos. But when I look at that photograph at the top right, a lot of things come to mind. Uh, this is a person who is sitting with someone who, had she really been of a certain class or caste or something, might not have been sitting exactly like that in this exact space, in that exact position. Um, this is a person who potentially 
was relatively familiar enough that she moved with these people in a, um, in a way that really had to do with the intellectual production of the work. And that, to me, is something I've been really trying to grapple with and think about. And I think that you know, there might have been a lot of reasons for her, if she were a, you know, this is a person who's also educated in some of the finest schools in Colombo, there would be every reason not to include that photograph in a book. It, it, can, it could have been a damning photograph in certain ways. And I think there's something very important for us to sit with, that um, this is a person who is building a citational scaffold, in a sense. This is a person who's citing that craftsperson in a really important way. Um, so, you know, let's let that hang for a minute as well. Um, but the other thing I want to get to is that, you know, she also includes in her book many photographs of herself on a construction site. Um, this, um, I'll show you a project that's done uh, that I, I learned a lot about, but this is um, um, the Senanaika Flats. It's one of the um, major housing projects that she did. It's really a very lovely, um, it, this is its kind of uh, contemporary, it's, it, it, these are contemporary photographs and so they're all, um, you know, you can see the state of the building, it's relatively intact. They're all very lovely little bungalow type apartments inside this building. Um, I've, uh, and I've loved in her book the way she comments on a building like this. Um, she says at the very end, the structure was to have a flat RC slab, but was altered by the RC engineer to a slab and beam structure. I love that she has this kind of commentary on the construction. And I came to learn later on, again, these are you know some of the many photographs of her in, in her own book of her on construction sites. But this is a photograph that I have sat with also for a very long time. I came to learn that most of her buildings in Colombo, in, including the Senanaika flats that I just showed you, were built by this one contractor, a Mr. Stephen. And um, I came to learn about this. I had the privilege of meeting uh, the son and granddaughter of this contractor, Mr. Stephen, um, and Pinia Samaratunga, who's on the right, herself is, um, you know, a marvelous architect in her own right. And hearing her talk about her grandfather's work with Minette da Silva, her hearing her cite Minette da Silva, in a time when, you know, even in 2023, you can graduate from um, the, the, you know, the the main architecture school in Sri Lanka and not have learned about Minette da Silva in any of your courses. Um, understanding her as having effectively become an architect because she had this model in her life, to me, is another way to think about a living citational practice. A little different from bell hooks, but in a way, not so different. I, I do keep coming back to this photograph and what it means for, so first of all, for me, this is like a super South Asian looking photograph. This man in his sarong on the construction site, there couldn't be like a more um, uh, typical picture of South Asian masculine um, attitude. But look at the way that he's looking at her. Like look at the respect in his face that this is this woman architect. And I, I, I do just keep coming back, she too in her sari in all of these pictures. It's quite amazing, actually. And then, I mean, maybe I also get this because I have met his um, son and his granddaughter, and I know that the way that they speak of the way he spoke of her. Um, but I do think um, there's something about this that to me is another form of citation. It has to do with the way we treat the people that we're with, the kind of respect that we show, the way we show it. And what does it mean that she put this photograph in her book? She probably didn't think about this photograph as much as I did. But I do think that there's something in this that helps us think about this, these broader 
intangible ways of giving credit, of you know, creating intersectional care around the things that we want to be in the world so that we start to name them over and over again and create a, a little bit of you know, an echo around them. So you know, with all of that, I really wanted to just sort of give you that to think about. Um, I've been talking for a long time. I want to thank you. And um, I do want to ask you to think for a minute about who you cite, who will you cite. So thanks so much. Um, thank you so much for this uh, uh, presentation. I feel like it was quite emotional, I, I will say, for me. And thinking, thinking, like b the connection, the connections between citation and care, and then what it means to cite, and um, who do we cite, and. I was trying to think through uh, while, while you were presenting and thinking of citing because of caring, and then I was thinking, why? Like, why do we care about that something in the end? And I feel like this has also to do with with an inspiration, like something that we find in common, something that connects us. Like there is a bond created that then this citation becomes part of us. And then I started thinking about. Um, memory and how do we remember things and perhaps it's interesting to mention here that memory at least in the Greek language relates to the word care so they have the same root uh, so um, I, I thought that that memory then is the, the things that we want to keep the things that we care about and we um, we carry with us and perhaps these citations are also shaping our identity and our personal, uh, but also our collective identity. And then trying to connect also with your uh, project about the readers that they were reading out loud, um, how, how different it is to read something on your own and then reading it out loud um, Making it, making it public in a way. So, is it is it this this citation um, needs to be public? Is it about sharing? Is it about reading? Um, about creating this community? Um, and also, you you cited authors here, and I th I thought that's it was like an act of of caring, an act of um, sharing. Um, who, um, who you are and what you care about. And I thought that was beautiful. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Lovely. <laughs> OK, well, sorry. I do, I do have um, another question. I suppose, and then we can open it to the audience. Um, but you, you mentioned this word um, scaffolding, um, scaffold, um, quite often, and I really enjoy the way you use it as a term, as a layer of protection, as a layer of space making, as a layer um, of use, whether of being held or um, if it manifests through literature. And so I was wondering, what you would say your scaffolding is in your work as a teacher, as a director, as a researcher? I think it's on. Is it on? Oh. Well, you know, some of my scaffolding is sitting in the front row. <laughs> including the one name I didn't actually name out loud because it was on the screen. Um, no, I think, um, you know, I, I think that like everyone, we read and we think with the people that we read. We also maybe don't read books, but we look at things that inspire us, works of 
art or architecture. And to me, those have over a long time been things, I have a lot of touchstones in that way. So I think in some ways, that's, since I was very little, I've always had these things that I go back to and return to. Um, I didn't understand for a long time, because I don't think I grew up in these kinds of environments, I didn't understand that that was an intellectual life. I just didn't know, I didn't know what, I didn't know that term, but I also just didn't know that when you are a person who has these touchstones that you return to, I didn't know that that was what that was called. But I think that more than that, you know, it, the way that I work, as you can see, is quite embodied. And so I find that I really need to have actual person-to-person um, -person contact, really, to learn. Um, and so that is the biggest way that, you know, I, if I, you know, to be blunt, like my bibliography is sitting in the front row. But I also think of it that way. I have a very embodied relationship with what I read, but I also have a very embodied relationship with who I learn from. So I've had this privilege in the, you know, to be able to learn from actual people who, you know, I've had the privilege of meeting with Minette herself before she died. I think those are things that to me more and more are, are where I get the lessons. And it may just be that I'm not, um, you know, smart enough to think abstract in the abstract, which I know a lot of people can do. Um, and I tend to need something to be very concrete. But that to me is also like what drew me to architecture, because architecture for me is really explicit. Um, the, a lot of what, we can just see it all and touch it all, it's all right there. So that to me is a very important thing. I don't know if that quite answers your question, but. Yeah, that answers it completely. I think also um, what you're saying about embodiment um, showcased itself as well um, in your research where you're um, looking into satellite imagery um, mm -hmm. versus um, relaying, not relaying, I'm sorry, but um, versus the distance of being up close and personal, of seeing it in person. Mm. So I think that's a very direct relationship and mm. yeah. Yeah, that's true, I didn't think about that. Um, yeah, and I, it's funny, I don't ever talk about it in terms of scale, because for me it's never even abstracted in that kind of analytical way. It really is about a more material and embodied relation with the objects. I don't know. I'm also trained in art history, so I think that's also the way we're taught to think, is be very close to the object. Um, Thank you. I think we're going to open up questions to the audience now, if anybody has any. Um, hello, thank you so much for just a wonderful talk and I really appreciated, I think, how personalized and like the sense of embodiment I think very much came through in your work. Um, and I'm curious in the context of the citation, um, how does the citation translate and how does this discussion between the person that is writing the thing and the bibliography or sources that they're accumulating, how does that remain a conversation and where does body embodiment exist when the people that we're citing are not in the room and when the p the communities in which we're referencing were just exist and I say we as like scholars and people who are he who are here to learn when we as scholars are existing as intermediaries to just translate what is these embodied experiences of um, people in which we are saying that we're citing. So I, I don't know if that makes sense, but just to clearly ask, like, how does this 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 process of what it seems like you're doing the scaffolding and the citations of care, how does that translate when the people that we're citing are not in the room? And what is our justice as intermediaries to expand not only the inclusion of their citations, but how do we like bring the room to their spaces to really like unlock that, the power which is giving credit to the the knowledge and the learning that's happening and the way that we're like bringing that forward, if that makes sense. Mm, that's very, very beautiful. But can I just ask you, is Bell Hooks not in the room? Yeah, she is. I mean, it is, I'm not trying to be smart or clever. I really am, it's a, this is a question I grapple with. Because for me, there's a, a way in which you make community around people. And I mean, Bell Hooks and Walter Rodney are pretty low-hanging fruit, like if there's anyone you're going to make community around. But I do think that that's what 
what must be done. I mean, I think that's how we're going to forge a way forward. I, I mean, we are up against many, many crises, and I think this is the way. Like you, you really work in community um, in that way around and around thinkers who were also doing the same thing. Hi, hello, Anu. Thank you so much for the insightful presentation. Um, I think I have a question with regard to contextualizing what you've just said with relation to the institution and how um, I feel like many institutions tend to be very self-referential in their citations. Mm -hmm. And um, that could be said about the establishment of the canon and the reinforcement of that. Um, and I would be interested in your take on, because I feel like the presentation so much about the untapped, the undertapped citations or that are living and that are under discussed or undercovered. Um, like how would you how, how would contemporary historic historiography like cover that and how should pedagogy address the, the undersighted or like how do we bring that to a main stage or a bigger stage to for, for more to be discussed and for more important conversations to be had around the around those topics. Like, I wonder um, if you have explored or if you have any thought on around that. Mm. I mean, shouldn't you take this question? We have Professor Leon attempting to deal with this as we speak. Um, I mean, I don't know. You know, it's, it's funny. When I was preparing this talk, I was remembering that um, it makes me really sad to remember this, actually. God, I might even start crying. I'm sorry. I'm feeling somewhat emotional also. But when I first learned about bell hooks, which is now probably about 25 years ago, I learned about her as an angry person. I was all, like every, she would come up a lot because I think it was a moment when it was like an ad, there was an advent of media studies and she wrote about film. What, God, I'm sorry, I'm very emotional about this. But anyway, I um, remember hearing from people, oh, she's very angry, she's very angry. And for years, I didn't actually really read much. I think I just really took what people said. I, you know, Later, of course, I've read a lot of her work, and I came to learn that she live, lived only two hours from where I was supposed to, where I grew up. And so I was supposed to go and meet her um, just before she died. <laughs> I was supposed to um, go and meet her. Um, and I, you know, finally, like so many decades later, I bothered to try to to meet her, and then I never got to. I think that's why I'm feeling very emotional, because I just think um, it's so tragic that that is the way that I was introduced to her work. It seems to me so absurd that she was ever characterized this way. But of course she was characterized this way for all the reasons that you say, that there's a sort of internal um, citational structure, and anyone who's saying something that doesn't align with it you know, is a, is threatening, even if they're literally talking about love. So I think, <laughs> yeah, so I, I think that this is the challenge. I don't have any great answers for it, but I do think that there is something in what, like what I just read of what she said that is important, that the least we can do is speak it. The least we can do is just say something. I know it sounds like this thing that teachers always say, oh, ask your question because you never know. Someone else might have the same question. But it kind of is that problem. Like, the, like silence truly doesn't get us anywhere. I mean, I could have met bell hooks <laughs> had I just, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like that. I really feel that, that, you know, there, there are these things that we, there are these experiences we rob ourselves of First of all, because we don't speak, but we don't try to make a collective speech. Um, that to me is like a big lesson of this idea of talking back. It's not about being angry and like talking to the man or whatever. I think it really is much more about talking back, like talking. For I mean, for her at least, it was always about just there should be a conversation, there should be a dialogue and a discourse. It was never that I'm gonna like yell at you unidirectionally. 
So I think that, you know, and I, I do think that it, yeah, I imbibed, I think, a lot of lessons from that one essay, actually, that I think is really useful. But it really does have to do with um, a larger structure in which that kind of speech is perceived as oppositional, simply because it is speech. Just ontologically, it's not allowed to be. And the fact that it's there is perceived as a somehow a kind of a threat to the existing order. So I don't know. I mean, there are, you know, all of these kinds of institutions are heterogeneous. Like they, are, they simply aren't monolithic. So I think that these, like speech from these little corners is the way to do this because then you start to see, you know, that maybe there are many more alignments. And you were all just talking about this earlier that like, oh, you're just trying to have a small, yeah. they're, you're getting together with people from MIT. God forbid that that great wall be kind of <laughs> surmounted, you know? Like, I think these are like little <laughs> things that are, that it sounds ridiculous, but they're quite big in the littleness of what they're doing, like, I think. It's, I think it's those kinds of things, but it, it's, it's very small. It will be perceived as trivial, but maybe it's not. Yeah, maybe, maybe with enough of them, it becomes something much larger. I know it sounds so vague, but I think that's also how we like to think we operate. Mm. I'll just hand this to you, because I it's in your hand. Thank you for this wonderful talk. I had a question actually about the photographs that you showed where um, Minette de Silva is with the craftspeople, and then there were another set of photographs where, which I think are from Kumaraswamy's books of craftspeople. And I was wondering if we can think of uh, the different kinds of representations of craftspeople here and whether mm. um, de Silva's work speaks to a different register than Kumaraswamy's, and if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I haven't done enough on this yet, but it's obviously a question. I mean, Ethel doesn't show up in any of those photographs. Not that she has to, but um, Ethel Kumarasamy is, the, is um, the, the wife and comrade of um, Ananda Kumarasamy who took all those photographs that end up in his book. And, um, but I do think that um, some of it is, also, we can't know the conditions under which those photographs were taken. Maybe they were there for you know half an hour, and they just had to quickly document. We don't, we don't get that um, what do you call critical positionality of the ethnographer. We don't. We'll never know. I mean, people are doing research on it, but I think I do really keep coming back to this photograph of Minette in this you know squatting in this position. You really, I mean, just, I just don't think that that's a common, that's really not common. There were, there, and there would be many, many reasons we shouldn't see that photograph. So I think that too was, um, that's kind of what I keep coming back to. But I don't want to also just, you know, condemn the Kumarasamis for, I think these are two different times. And there are also, these are also two different, um, whatever, registers. He is trying to make a much larger argument in the book that those photographs appear in about um, the meaning of these crafts, and I think he's trying to locate an you know an episteme in the in the non-West, let's say, just to use a shorthand. So I think his argument and his thrust are totally different. This is also part of why he's not bothering to credit his own wife who took all the photographs. There's many uh, other little criticisms that I think are getting s subsumed into what uh, like a larger project. So I, in a way, think, you know, we can't isolate the images and analyze them together like that. But the reason they should be looked at together with Minette's work is that they likely travel to the exact same villages on the exact same route. We've had this conversation about itineraries of architects. And I think that I'm, I'm very sure now, having now traveled the same itinerary myself, that they went to the exact same places and talked to the exact same people who, by dint of um, you know, social exclusions, happened to be in the same communities. So that, to me, is the more interesting problem. Hey. 
And how is Ruhi? <laughs> As you can see, she's very angry that I've traveled too much. <laughs> I saw that. I, I have an embarrassing question. Yeah. Um, I, th this was a beautiful talk. Thank you so much. Um, you students are so privileged uh, to have you um, and to listen to you and to learn from you. Um, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, the sort of implicit meditation on photography and citation, and because I I know how you do research, and uh, this was sort of like um, a lesson in uh, embedding your method into the talk um, in a really beautiful way, and I was wondering if you ever. If people ever take pictures of you when you are on the site, I was thinking of Minette da Silva having her picture taken and sort of inserting herself into the site. I was just curious about um, the vulnerability of um, being photographed. You take a beautiful photograph. Uh, but I, I, I was thinking, you know, there, there's a way around thinking about you know taking someone else's picture and taking your picture with them um, and I was just wondering um, and and I understand you know if you're giving a lecture you're not going you are here in the room already but I was wondering if um, if maybe that's a way around the sort of taking someone else's picture and taking their picture with them and appearing also in the picture. So I, I was just wondering if mm. you, if, if your picture is taken when you're doing research. Yeah, um, that's a really interesting I, point, this sort of wrapping. The, there is, was a photograph in Dada with, um, I don't know if you saw it. It was, yeah, the one, the women who are making the restaurant, I'm in, a, I'm in one of those photos. Um, I. I mostly was in photos with, when I was with kids. I was separated from my son at the time, so I would miss him a lot, and I would hang out with kids a lot, and I would give them my camera. Um, that's the only time, but I didn't, I don't, I mean, I don't, I'm not publishing those. It also feels very narcissistic. No, 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 I understand, but I, um, but I think it just, it, it's, I, I was just interested in that because it opens a conversation on also you becoming vulnerable and no. like giving that, power to someone else. Yeah, I mean, the question of vulnerability is interesting. And I wonder, so, you know, we might read it that way because it's a refugee camp. But for example, you know, Minette puts a picture of herself almost on every single page, so many pictures of construction. I had at first thought that she was overcompensating, like needing to say, I'm a, I make construction, I am whatever. But I, the more I've really gotten to know her work process, the more I really think that actually this was just her work process, because she also wasn't doing drawings. She was doing a lot of direction on site. Um, so I, but I do think that there's something kind of, in, I think of it as like echoes. And I mean, I really think there's an echo there of like, you're not, it's not just about what you make, it's about how you make it. And maybe I have learned that from Minute again, to like really make a citation, because I think it's very important to give her credit, because I, how, I, again, this is a literary architect. There aren't so many architects who make a book like this. There are lots of architects who have books about them that we put on tables. But I think this is an architect who made her, she literally handmade the book, but also she made it in a certain way. So I think that this business of like, being, I don't think she was vulnerable, but maybe you're right. We're always vulnerable when the lens is pointed at us because you can't control then what is seen or your own image, or at least you never can, but it's a moment when you admit that you can't control it. So, but yeah, I think, um, I mean, you're giving me something to think about because I, I definitely have not included photographs of myself in the book. Uh, yeah, I don't think I even include the one I showed here. And um, 
You know, I've been over it and over it in my head too, and I have had you know students ask this pointed question of like, what is your photographic practice? And to me, my photographic practice is that it's been 12 years of every night when I fall asleep, I all these images are in my head. I've spent a lot of time with these images, so I know what can be used and what can't be used. But I think I'd never thought I used my own words, but I don't or I whatever my words in dialogue with someone but i don't use images of myself because i don't i don't think i'm the story i'm not one of the makers of this place but i don't know if that's right i mean it's a good question not, not thinking for the book just thinking for the process yeah for the process, I'm really happy to show that kind of thing because I think um, it is the process. Also, people should understand that Dadaab has been like a home to not just humanitarians and refugees, but researchers and lots of people. Angelina Jolie, like lo really lots of different people have been there in substantive ways. So that's part of this, that story, but that's not the kind of the, uh, the, ma the story of making it. Hi, thank you very much for the lecture. Can you please tell us more about the project or the research you are doing in the refugee camps in Africa? Yeah, um, I mean, this is a project begun in uh, 2010. Uh, I had been um, um, working in East Africa, and I, um, I, I worked there as part of a, um, a a research NGO that is connected with the International Rescue Committee. Um, the NGO is called the Women's Refugee Commission, and they're doing a. Um, they do research um, for the sake of advocacy, and I, th at the time, thought I really wanted to be able to visit Dadab. Dadab's in a critical security zone. It's really an object of the security state and surveillance, and uh, so um, the only way to get in is to the only way for a foreigner to get in without just going and assuming a lot of risks. And at the time I had a small child and I didn't think it was responsible for me to assume that kind of risk. I started working with this NGO and I worked on a gender violence project. So we were researching um, how livelihoods impact gender violence. Um, I was also doing my PhD dissertation and so I used that, they allowed me to ask my own questions and do my own research on the side. I started reach, researching the, like, the architecture and long history of this region and, the, and um, the architecture in the region. So that is a little bit of how it started. And then since then I've been doing a lot more work in Nairobi and with artists and with other people in Kenya and so, and environmentalists and others. So the scholarship has really, it's not only on this one site, but this site for me is a very important um, uh, place to think with. It has, it, it has a very important history in and of itself, but it serves as a sort of object lesson and a way for us to develop a concept history. So that's what I've been focusing on. Thanks for asking. It's we a very important like heritage site too, I think. Sorry. Um, I think it, you know, people think of refugee camps as having no architecture and no history. And I think instead this is a place that we can start to really, really think differently about that. As a as a place that belongs to the common heritage. We have a question from our online audience. Oh. This is from know. Dolores Hayden. They say, thank you for this wonderful talk. I am very moved by your research on women builders and architects. Can you tell us how you began to choose these topics for your research? <laughs> Maybe from reading your books, Dolores Hayden. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I have a very uh, quick answer to that. Um, but, <laughs> you know, it is a thing that we learn over time that, you know, it's, it's not a small thing that I had a child at the time that I started working on this, because I think it made me ask very different kinds of scholarly questions that had much more to do with um, 
you know, th I th think I thought of time very differently than I might have had I gone in without that particular experience. But um, I think I also just um, have always been interested in spatial politics and gender politics and so on. That's maybe the broader answer. That's the boring answer. <laughs> Goodness, Dolores Hayden is watching. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Because if not, we we should thank um, Anne Rada um, for being so vulnerable uh, in front of us and uh, caring and sharing your work. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Uh, joining us. Uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank you so yeah. much. <laughs>